Short Lives of the Dominican Saints, Part 9 June 10th Blessed John Dominici, Bishop and Confessor, 1350-1420 Blessed John Dominici was born at Florence at about 1350. He was of humble parentage and imperfect education, and had, moreover, an impediment in his speech, so that his first application for admission to the order of St. Dominic was refused. He persevered in his request, however, and was received when about eighteen years of age. It was observed that, in assuming the habit, he seemed to acquire a marvellous nobility of manner. His talents were found to be of the highest order, and he was soon held in great repute for his extraordinary eloquence. Earnestly desiring to devote himself to the ministry of the Word, the special office of his order, he implored the intercession of St. Catherine of Siena that he might be delivered from the impediment of speech which had hitherto prevented him from preaching. His petition was granted, and from that time he became one of the most renowned preachers of the day, so much so that when St. Vincent Ferrer was invited to preach at Florence, he excused himself on the plea that, as the city possessed so eloquent an order as Father John Dominici, there should be no need of him. Blessed John received yet another favor through the intercession of St. Catherine, for, being at Rome in the jubilee year, and unable by reason of a bad foot to make the visits to the four basilicas required for gaining of indulgences, he had recourse to the seraphic virgin of Siena, whom he had seen in his youth, and was at once entirely delivered from his infirmity. He was intimately associated with her confessors and other fathers who had been her disciples, and he took a leading part in the reform of the order, set on foot by blessed Raymond of Capua, who appointed him vicar provincial of the Roman province. Later on, we find him endeavoring to restore regular life in the various important convents of which he was successfully superior, and founding a house of strict observance near Fizol, near Florence, where he gave the habit to St. Antoninus and to two artists, Fra Angelico and Fra Benedetto. Blessed John was himself an artist of no mean talent, and enriched the choral books of his convent with beautiful miniatures. He rightfully regarded art as a means of instructing the young and the ignorant in the truths of religion and of raising the mind to heavenly aspirations. With this view he greatly encouraged its cultivation both among the friars and the religious women of the order. But Blessed John's title to the gratitude of the faithful in general is chiefly based on the important part which he had in the extinction of the great schism of the West, which for nearly half a century had divided the allegiance of Christendom. Created Archbishop of Ragusa, and cardinal by Pope Gregory the Twelfth, he had a large share in the convocation of the Council of Constance, at which he assisted as that pontiff's legate. The great object of the council was to obtain the resignation of all three claimants of the pontifical dignity, in order that the fathers might then proceed to the valid election of one to whose lawful claims none could offer opposition. Blessed John succeeded in inducing John the, T the Twenty-Third to offer his resignation on condition Pope Gregory should also resign. The anti-pope 
little knew that the holy cardinal held the formal resignation of that pontiff in his hand, and was thunderstruck when he immediately produced it. Then, laying aside his cardinal's hat, Blessed John added these words, And I, who came as that pontiff's legate, also renounce my dignity and my cardinal late. And so saying, he took his place among the bishops. The fathers of the council insisted, however, on restoring him to his rank. The remaining anti-pope, Benedict the Thirteenth, better known as Peter de Luna, was deposed, and the council proceeded to elect Odo Colonna, who took the title of Martin the Fifth. The vigor and disinterestedness shown by Blessed John at that crisis restored peace to the Church. At the request of the Emperor, the holy man was now sent as an apostolic legate to Hungary and to Bohemia. Then, much disturbed by the heretical followers of John Hus and Jerome of Prague, in this mission he did much to confirm the people in their adhesion to the true faith, and to encourage them in offering a determined resistance to the encroachments of the Turks. Whilst thus engaged, he fell sick at Buda, and, strengthened by the holy sacraments of the Church, piously fell asleep in the Lord on the 10th of June, 1420 leaving behind him many learned writings. His tomb was desecrated by the Turks when they took and sacked Buddha. He was beatified by Gregory the Sixteenth. June twelfth, Blessed Stephen Bendeli, Confessor, 1369-1450 Blessed Stephen was born about 1369 at Castel Nuovo in the northwest of Italy and entered the order of St. Dominic at an early age. He was a model of prayer and penance and of every religious virtue and excelled also in learning, becoming an eminent canonist and theologian, and teaching with great fruit at the University of Pavia but his chief renown was as a preacher, and for many years he devoted himself to this ministry with much success, and that hesitated not to compare him to the Apostle St. Paul. The people flocked around his pulpit, and he drew an almost countless multitude of sinners to repentance and induced many to forsake the vanities of the world and embrace the religious state. God confirmed his preaching by a great number of miracles. It is much to be regretted that so few details have been preserved of the life of this holy man, who evidently occupied a very distinguished position in his own day. Worn out by labor and old age, Blessed Stephen died at the convent of Saluzzo on June 11, 1450, and the multitude of pictures and ex-votos hung around his tomb testify to the many graces granted through his intercession. In the year 1487, the city of Saluzzo was besieged and on point of falling into the hands of the enemy, when it was miraculously delivered by the appearance on the ramparts of our Blessed Lady and a Dominican friar, universally believed to be Blessed Stephen. The anniversary of this wonderful deliverance is still commemorated at Saluzzo by an annual festival. Blessed Stephen Bandelli was beatified by Pius the Ninth. June 18th, Blessed Osana, Virgin, 1449-1505. Blessed Osana was born of wealthy and honorable parents at Mantua, in the north of Italy, 1449, 
When she was only six years old, the family went to spend the summer in the country. One day, as little Osana was wandering alone in the meadows by the riverside, an angel appeared to her and instructed her in the love of God, saying to her, See how every creature proclaims with all his might, Love God, all ye dwellers of the earth, for he hath made all things in order to win your love. Soon afterwards our Lord himself met her on the same spot in the form of a lovely child, with a crown of thorns upon his head, and bearing on his shoulders a heavy cross. My beloved child, he said to Osana, I am the son of the Virgin Mary and thy Creator. I have always loved children, because their hearts are pure. I willingly admit virgins as my spouses. I guard their virginity, and when they call upon me with the words, O oh, good Jesus, I instantly come to their assistance. This vision was the call to Osana to follow her divine spouse in the path of his sufferings, and she responded to it by an act of entire consecration of herself to his will. It was her ardent desire to dedicate herself solemnly to God's service in some monastery, but after many negotiations for this object had failed, it was revealed to her that she was not to enter the cloister, but to sanctify herself in the world as a tertiary of our holy order. This determination caused great grief to her parents. Nor was it until a dangerous illness had brought her to the brink of the grave that they would consent to her receiving the habit, which she at last did at the age of fourteen. It was not, however, permitted to her for a long series of years to make her solemn procession. She constantly longed for this happiness, but, understanding that the obstacles which were continually raised against it were ordained by God for her greater perfection, she humbly submitted herself to his divine will. It was not until she had attained the age of fifty-five that, in the last year of her life, she at length publicly bound herself by the vows of religion. She had, however, at the time of her clothing, made a private vow of obedience, and would never do the slightest thing without the leave of those who were placed over her. Blessed Osana was favored with continual raptures and ecstasies in prayer, which she was unable to conceal from the busy eye of the curious, and these heavenly favors were made a constant subject of reproof and persecution. The other tertiaries persisted in regarding them as nothing but a voluntary affectation of sanctity, and threatened to deprive her of the habit unless they ceased. They also murmured, greatly, because, at the fame, as the fame of her sanctity spread, persons of rank thronged about her to ask her counsel or to gratify their curiosity. But Osana's patience and humility were never in the least disturbed. Her divine spouse had made known to her, as in earlier times to St. Catherine of Siena, and later to Blessed Margaret Mary, the secret of his heart. And we are expressly told that it was to that never-failing fountain of consolation that she had recourse whenever tribulation pressed heavily upon her. And when prevented from approaching the sacrament of penance as often as she would have wished, she confessed her daily frailties to her good Jesus, as she loved to call him. The nuptials of the blessed of her soul, which she so ardently desired to accompany by her profession, and which were in that manner delayed for so many years, were mystically solemnized in the presence of the Mother of God and the whole court of heaven. This and other spiritual favors more and more increased the fire of divine love which burnt within her and filled her with an equally ardent desire to suffer. Grieving that she could not be more conformed to the likeness of her crucified Lord, 
she one day cast herself at his feet, exclaiming, Oh, my only love, must the thorns then be for thee alone, for thee alone the nails and the cross, and for me sweetness and consolation? Ah, not so. I will not share thy glory unless thou make me share in thy pains. And thus for two years she incessantly besought the eternal goodness to grant her that which her soul longed for, a conformity of suffering. Then, at length, the crown of thorns was granted to her, and, later on, the sacred stigmata. At each of these heavenly favors, the agony of her mortal frame increased to an almost inconceivable extent, yet still she was not satisfied. A longing arose in her heart to share in those unknown and awful sufferings which filled the heart of Jesus while he hung upon the cross. Then, in answer to her prayer, her divine spouse plunged into her loving heart a long and terrible nail. The agony of this transfiction must have caused her death, had not the same divine hand relieved her. But this cutting and dividing of her heart was often repeated, in after years, in answer to her unsatisfied entreaties. During this life of mysterious suffering, Osana ceased not to labor for the souls of others by prayer and works of charity, and often offered her body and soul to God to receive the chastisement due to inveterate sinners or to poor souls in purgatory. Her approaching death was announced to her four years previously by blessed Columba of Rieti, who appeared to her in great glory at the moment of her own departure out of this life. The death of Blessed Osana took place on the 18th of June, 1505. Three years afterwards her body was still incorrupt. Leo X gave permission for her feast to be celebrated in the Diocese of Mantua, and this privilege was extended to the Dominican order by Innocent the Twelfth. June twenty second, Blessed Innocent the Fifth, Pope and Confessor, twelve twenty five to twelve seventy six. Blessed Innocent the Fifth known before his elevation to the papacy by the name of Peter of Tarantes, was born of noble parents at that town, situated at the foot of the Alps, on the confines of Savoy, a territory then dependent on the Dukes of Burgundy, about A.D. 1225. While still quite a child, he was sent to study at the University of Paris, where he received the Dominican habit from the hands of Blessed Jordan, the second Master General of the Order of Preachers, when only nine years old. He is believed to have been one of those young postulants admitted on occasion of the general chapter of 1234. To the remonstrances of the Capitular Fathers, who complained that these children were so ignorant of Latin that scarcely to be able to read a lesson of Matins, even after much previous preparation, the Holy Master General gently replied, Suffer these little ones to come, and forbid them not. Know that you will see many, yeah, most of them acquit themselves glori gloriously of the office of preaching, and God will make use of them for the work of saving souls, in preference to many others of cultured mind. In none was this prophecy more brilliantly fulfilled than in little Peter of Tarentes. To extraordinary beauty of person he joined the highest gifts of mind and heart. In the shadow of the cloister, like the child Jesus in the holy house at Nazareth, he daily grew in wisdom and age, and grace with God and men. 
When only twenty-eight, he was judged capable of teaching theology at the university at the same time as his intimate friend, St. Thomas Aquinas. And we are particularly told that his merit was not in the least eclipsed by that of the angel of the schools. He also composed commentaries on the four books of the sentences of Peter the Lombard and on Holy Scripture and other learned works which in their day were scarcely less prized than those of St. Thomas himself. Hence, in the year 1259, he was chosen with Blessed Albert the Great, St. Thomas and two other distinguished religious, to draw up a general plan of studies to be followed in all Dominican schools. At the age of forty, his rare prudence, his knowledge of men, his admirable meekness, and his invincible firmness, caused him to be elected provincial of his order in the province of France, which then numbered some fifty convents. His journeys on the visitation of his province were always made on foot, with the simplicity of a pro poor friar. He everywhere diffused the good order of odor of his virtues and kept alive primitive fervor and the zeal for souls in the hearts of his brethren. Meanwhile, the masters and students of the University of Paris, who deeply regretted his absence, earnestly begged to have him back amongst them. The general chapter of the order granted their petition, and Father Peter returned to Paris where he took his doctor's degree and succeeded St. Thomas as the head of the school. In the year 1269, however, he was re-elected provincial. Three years later, Blessed Gregory X, who then filled the chair of St. Peter and who had formerly been one of his pupils at Paris, appointed him Archbishop of Lyons and Primate of France. A few months later he raised him to the dignity of cardinal, at the same time as the great Franciscan, St. Bonaventure, and made him bishop of Ostia and Velletri, and dean of the sacred college, commanding him to continue the administration of the archdiocese of Lyons until the nomination of his successor in that see. The saintly pontiff employed the new cardinal to assist him in making preparations for the general council, which he had convoked at Lyons, for the purpose of effecting a reunion between the Greek and Latin churches, and organizing a fresh crusade for the recovery of the Holy Land. The council opened on May 7th, 1274. Cardinal Peter of Tarentaise, took a distinguished part in its proceedings, and displayed an extraordinary talent for business. He was specially charged with all that concerned the reunion of the Greeks with the Latins, and succeeded in inducing the ambassadors of the Greek emperor to submit to the faith and authority of the Roman Church. It fell to his lot to preach the funeral servant of his friend and colleague, St. Bonaventure, who died at Lyons during the castle, council. And he did so with a touching eloquence which caused the whole of his audience to mingle their tears with his own. In January of 1276, Blessed Gregory X died, and Cardinal Peter of Tarentaise was unanimously elected as his successor assuming the name of Innocent V. The holy man immediately set himself to labor zealously for the peace of Christendom, the repression of the Moors, who were threatening a fresh invasion of Spain, the acceptance by the Greeks of the adhesion of their ambassadors to reunion with the Roman Church, and the undertaking of a fresh crusade against the infidels. Such splendid beginnings excited the greatest hopes for the new pontificate, but it was doomed to be of brief duration. 
On June twenty second, an attack of malignant fever closed the Holy Pontiff's career. He had sat in the chair of Peter only five months and two days. He was laid to rest in the Lateran Basilica and rendered himself illustrious by a host of miracles. Pope Leo the Thirteenth raised him to the altars of the church in 1898. July 3rd Blessed Mark of Modena, Confessor, 1498 Very few details concerning the life of this holy servant of God have been preserved. He was born at Modena and entered the order of preachers at an early age. Taking his holy father, St. Dominic, as the model of his life, he devoted himself to prayer and contemplation, practiced severe austerities, and was most exact even in the smallest observances prescribed by the constitutions. He became renowned for sacred science and preached the word of God with, some, with much fruit of souls in various parts of Italy. He also wrote some useful spiritual books. Becoming prior of the convent of Pizarro, he was a beautiful example of every religious virtue of his community and was venerated by the people as a saint. On one occasion he was sent for by a lady who had just lost a little son of only three or four years old. Weep not, said he to the afflicted mother, your little one is in heaven. Do not wish to have him back again, for you would lose him a second time, and in a more distressing manner. But as the lady would not listen to reason, the servant of God betook himself to prayer. Then, taking the child by the hand, he cried out in a loud voice, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, arise. The child instantly sat up, and blessed Mark restored him to his mother, full of health and vigor. But ten years later he died of the plague in much suffering. After undergoing immense labors for the glory of God and the salvation of souls, full of merits and good works, and worn out by age and sickness, blessed Mark slept the sleep of the just, pressing to his heart as he died the image of his crucified Master, whom he had tenderly loved throughout his whole life. His holy and happy death took place on the 21st of September, 1498. Later on, his remains were translated to the chapel of the Holy Rosary, on which occasion a delicious odor perfumed the church, and the bells rang out miraculously to the wonder of all. It became customary to expose his relics to public veneration every year on Whit Monday, and lamps were kept burning day and night before his picture, which hung beside his tomb. Pius the Ninth set the seal of the church to the veneration which have been thus rendered to Blessed Mark from time immemorial. July 7th, Blessed Benedict the Eleventh, Pope and Confessor, 1240-1304. Nicholas Bocassino, who assumed the name of Benedict the Eleventh when raised to the pontifical dignity, was born of poor parents at Treviso in Italy for 1240. He received his early education from an uncle, who held the office of parish priest, and at the age of fourteen he was admitted to the Dominican order at Venice. The next fourteen years of his life were devoted to prayer and study, after which he was employed in teaching sacred science to his brethren. 
He never allowed his lessons to interfere with his exercises of piety, or to prevent him from teaching the word of God. He also found time to write some learned commentaries on various parts of scripture, and other valuable works. After successively filling the offices of sub-prior and prior, and that of provincial of Lombardy, he was unanimously elected general of the order in 1296. During the two years and a half that he held this charge, the holy general ceased not to visit the convents of the order, always traveling on foot and encouraging his companions to face danger and fatigue by exclaiming, Come, dearest brethren, this is the glory of our order. Rigid and austere to himself, he was the gentlest of religious superiors towards his subjects. Contemporary historians call him the lover of the community, and are never weary of praising his virtues, and above all his singular humility of heart. In January of 1299, Pope Boniface the VIII, whose cause he had stoutly defended, created him cardinal priest of the title of Santa Sabina. Holy Father, he exclaimed, throwing himself at the Pope's feet, why have you laid so heavy a burden upon me? God has yet a heavier one in store for you, was the prophetic reply. Two years later he was promoted to the bishopric of Ostia and Velletri, made dean of the sacred college, and sent as legate to Hungary, which was at that time in a very disturbed condition. On his return to Italy, he found the Pope surrounded by enemies, the creatures of Philip the Fair of France, and had a glory of standing by the Holy Father's side at Anagni in company with only one other cardinal, when he was brutally assaulted and dragged from his throne. The cardinal of Santa Sabina succeeded in stirring up the inhabitants of Agnaghi to expel the sacrilegious rebels from their town. But the Pope did not long survive the outrages he had received, dying almost immediately after his return to Rome. The cardinals assembled in conclave eleven days after the death of Boniface and unanimously elected Cardinal Nicholas Boscasino as his successor in 1303. He assumed the name of Benedict out of veneration for his predecessor, who had borne that name before his elevation to the papacy, and took for his motto the words of the psalmist, Make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Europe was in a very troubled state at the commencement of the new pontificate, but the admirable prudence and energy of the pontiff did much for the restoration of peace and order. In particular, he succeeded in reconciling France with the Holy See, and in restoring the papal authority in Sicily and Denmark, and he greatly exerted himself to induce the princes of Christendom to lay aside their mutual differences in engage in a crusade against the infidels. Shortly after his elevation to the pontifical throne, his mother came to pay him a visit. The magistrates of Perugia, where he was then residing, on hearing of her arrival, received her with great pomp, arrayed her in costly apparel, and conducted her to the papal presence. But when the holy pontiff saw his mother richly dressed and accompanied by a splendid retinue, he refused to recognize her, saying, My mother was only a poor washerwoman and not a princess like this. Then she retired, laid aside her silk garments, and returned in the hubble garb of a peasant woman. When Benedict saw her thus, he came down from his throne to meet her, embraced her tenderly, and showed her every mark of respect and affection. Benedict's reign 
marked with vigor, justice, and clemency, unhappily lasted only eight months. His death, which took place at Perugia on the 7th of July, 1304, was believed to be the effect of poison, given him in some figs which had been presented to him by an unknown person. He was buried in the church of his order at Perugia, and many miracles were worked at his tomb. He was beatified by Pope Clement the Twelfth. July ninth, St. John of Cologne and his companions, the martyrs of Gorkum, 1572. The holy champions of the faith, whom the Church honors under the title of the Marker, Martyrs of Gorkum, suffered for the faith in Holland, 1572. At that time the whole country was overrun by the Calvinists, who had rebelled alike against the dominion of Spain and the authority of the Church. They succeeded in making themselves masters of the town of Gorkum, and caused all the clergy and religious of the place to be cast into prison. Father John of Cologne, of the Order of Preachers, having obtained permission of his superiors to minister to the wants of the faithful, thus bereft of all spiritual assistance, was then exercising the functions of the parish priest in the neighboring village of Hornar, and was in the habit of visiting Gorkum for the purpose of administrating administering the sacraments. On one of these occasions, having undertaken the journey in order to baptize an infant, he was seized and imprisoned with the others. Every cruelty which their inhuman enemies could devise was resorted to in order to induce the captives to renounce their faith, especially re with regard to the real presence of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist and the papal supremacy or to tempt them, at least, to some act of disobedience to the Church's laws. After keeping them for some time without food, nothing but meat was set before them, the day purposely chosen being Friday. All the prisoners except one preferred running the risk of starvation to disobeying the precept of the Church, and the one who yielded was not of the number of those nineteen who afterwards obtained the crown of martyrdom, the soldiers presented a loaded pistol at the mouth of Nicholas Popel, the second parish priest of Gorkum, bidding him now, if he dared, profess that faith which he had been wont to preach so boldly. The servant of God, nothing daunted, made an open profession of his belief. Then, thinking his last moments had come, he cried with a loud voice, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. His tormentors contented themselves for the present, however, with hanging him up and letting him fall again repeatedly, till he was half strangled. They inflicted the same cruelty on Nicholas Pick, the father guardian of the Franciscans, and when the rope broke and he fell apparently lifeless to the ground, they applied lighted candles to his head and face, from the effects of which, when he afterwards revived, he suffered great agony. The soldiers repeatedly beat their victims in the most barbarous manner, not even sparing one of the friars who was decrepit from old age, and who, at every blow he received, answered only, Thanks be to God. They took away nearly all their clothes, leaving them exposed to the cold all-night air, almost without covering. After a cruel captivity of about ten days, the prisoners were removed by water to Brill, suffering innumerable insults and hardships during the passage. On their arrival they were made to walk in procession through the town and round the gallows erected in the marketplace. The holy martyrs sang, as they went along, the litanies, the Salve Regina, the Te Deum, and the Stabat Mater. Amidst the mockery and the blasphemes of the spectators, 
They were then thrown into a dark and loathsome dungeon, where a secular priest and two fathers of the Premonstration order were joined to their number. Meantime, the relations of the Father Guardian, themselves infected with heretical opinions, were making every effort to obtain his liberation and that of the other prisoners, since, like a good shepherd, he steadily refused to accept his own release, unless his brethren might also be set free with him. Life and liberty were accordingly offered to all the prisoners, on the sole condition of renouncing their allegiance to the Pope, and when they indignantly rejected the infamous proposal, a hasty order was given for their execution. During the night between the 8th and 9th of July, they were led to a large barn outside the town, making their confessions to one another as they went. In this place they were all hanged to the number of nineteen, namely one Dominican, eleven Franciscans, and two Paymonstrators, one of whom had previously fallen from the faith, but had made generous reparation for his fall one canon regular of St. Augustine, and four secular priests. The history of one of these last also presented a signal instance of the mercy of God and of his secret judgments, for he had led a scandalous life, which he expiated by the heroism of his death, whereas another parish priest of irreproachable life who had been arrested with him, failed in courage and perseverance and missed the martyr's crown. Another of the sufferers, an old man of seventy, Godfrey Donaeus by name, was half-witted, yet he endured his captivity with extraordinary courage and generosity, and when at the last moment, by reason of his infirmity of mind, he was unconditionally offered his liberty, he refused, exclaiming, I see the heavens open, I long to be with my brethren. And, the last of that heroic band, he passed on to his reward. After the death of the martyrs, the soldiers cut and mangled the bodies in the most inhumane manner. But, that same night, God was pleased to make known the glory of his servants to some of their friends at Gorkum, who were so far from suspecting what was going on at Brill, that they even entertained well-grounded hopes of the liberation of the prisoners. A pious citizen of Gorkum, by name Matthias Thoran, was in the habit of rising every night to pray for the welfare of the state. As he was practicing his customary devotions at about four o'clock in the morning of July the ninth, he beheld this blessed troop of martyrs, clad in white garments with golden crowns upon their heads, resplendent with glory. When day was come, he told his fellow citizens the vision which had been granted him. A similar favor was vouchsafed on the same night to another inhabitant of Gorkum, so that the death of the martyrs was publicly known, and spoken of amongst the Catholics of that town long before the arrival of the messenger who brought the tidings from Brill. The beautiful shrub sprang up on the scene of their martyrdom, bearing nineteen fair white blossoms. Many miracles have been granted through the intercession of the martyrs of Gorkum, and the application of their relics, especially in cases of hernia, a malady which had some of them had suffered when on earth. They were beatified by Clement X in 1674, and solemnly canonized by Pius IX on the feast of Saints Peter and Paul in 1867 in the presence of upward three hundred bishops assembled in the Eternal City to celebrate the eighteenth centenary of the martyrdom of the Prince of the Apostles.
July 11th Blessed Ignatius Delgado and Dominic Henares, bishops, and their companions, martyrs. 1838-1839-1840 Of the glorious band of 77 martyrs beatified by Pope Leo XIII on May 27th in the Holy Year of Jubilee, 1900, 26 are assigned in the apostolic brief to the order of preachers, 19 by actual profession, and the remaining seven by their connection with the Dominican mission of Eastern Tonquin. They are often spoken of as the martyrs of the Annamite Church, the name of Annam having been formerly applied to a large extent of country then at the present day and they suffered in the persecution which raged during the years 1838, 1839, and 1840. The leaders of this heroic company were two Dominican prelates, Blessed Ignatius Delgado, Bishop of Melipotamus, and Vicar Apostolic of Eastern Tonquin, and his coadjutor, Blessed Dominic Henares, Bishop of Fezeta, and pro vicar apostolic of the same district. Both were Spaniards by birth, and both had labored in Tonquin for nearly half a century, having arrived there in 1790 and been invested with the episcopal dignity shortly afterwards. At the outbreak of the persecution in 1838, the two venerable prelates were on the point of concealing themselves in a large cavern which had been arranged as a hiding place, when they were betrayed into the hands of the soldiers who had been sent in search of them. Blessed Dominic managed on that occasion to escape, but Blessed Ignatius, who was very infirm, was seized and carried away in a cage which was so small that it was impossible for him to stand upright in it. On approaching the city of Nam Din, where a great concourse of people awaited his arrival, he beheld a crucifix laid across the entrance to be trampled on by all who passed through the gates. Pierced with grief at the sight, he insisted so earnestly on its removal that he was obeyed, but, as soon as his cage had been borne into the city, the sacred image was replaced on the ground, so that the faithful who were following their bishop in great numbers on his way of sorrows were unable to enter. Meanwhile, Blessed Dominic had also been captured and imprisoned in a cage, and he was now brought, together with his faithful catechist, Blessed Francis Chien, to the same city. For a few moments the two holy bishops and the blessed father Joseph Fernandez, vicar provincial of the order in Tonquin, who had also been seized, were confronted with each other and able to exchange a few words in their native tongue. Blessed Dominic and his catechists were the first to suffer martyrdom, being beheaded on June 25, 1838. On the following July 12th, Blessed Ignatius died in his cage of hunger and thirst, and exposure to the rays of a burning sun. The inhuman governor caused the sentence of decapitation, which had already been pronounced on the venerable old man, to be executed on his lifeless body. There suffered also in the same persecution eight native priests of the order, who appeared to have made their novitiate in the Philippine Islands, and eight devout tertiaries, of whom four were catechists, one was a doctor, another a tailor, and two were peasants. Faithful to their vocation, these holy members of the Third Order, whilst in prison, converted and baptized a hundred of their fellow captives. Some of these native martyrs were subjected to the most horrible torments that Oriental cruelty could devise, and one of the catechists, the blessed Thomas Toan, 
naturally of a weak and irresolute character, when put to the torture, twice renounced the faith and twice returned to it. After his second apostasy, his remorse bordered on despair. But, happily for him, there was in the same prison a priest, probably the blessed Joseph Hien, also a martyr, who consoled and absolved him. From that moment blessed Thomas was filled with heroic courage, and at every fresh insult and torment did but repeat, I have sinned against my God. He has forgiven me. Henceforth I must be forever faithful to him. He was starved to death in prison, passing to his reward on June 27, 1840. To these we must add three native secular priests belonging to the vicariate and three soldiers. The soldiers, after having courageously undergone many sufferings for the faith for the space of a whole year, at length miserably consented to trample on the cross. There were some grounds for believing that they were not wholly responsible for the act, which was committed, so it is said, under the influence of a potion which had been administered to them. Be this as it may, the poor men were broken-hearted when they realized what they had done, and as the governor refused to accept their retraction, two of them made their way to the king at Huey, boldly declared themselves to be Christians, and by his command were sawn asunder on board a ship. The third, who was too ill to travel, sent a written retractation by the hands of his comrades, and by the royal orders were st was strangled. July 13th Blessed James of Oregon, Bishop and Confessor, 1230-1298 Blessed James was born in the little village of Voragin, also called Verazzo, not far from Genoa. He entered the order of St. Dominic at the early age of fourteen, and devoted himself to the acquisition alike of learning and of sanctity, making marvelous progress in both. After teaching theology in various places, he was sent to preach throughout northern Italy. Such was his eloquence, and such the purity with which he spoke his mother tongue, that he took his place at once in the foremost rank of Italian orators. He was the first to translate the Bible into Italian, and he wrote several works, in particular a large and valuable book of sermons, a treatise in praise of our Blessed Lady, to whom he bore a tender devotion, and a collection of the lives of the saints, known as the Golden Legend, which became the most popular book of spiritual reading in the Middle Ages. It was translated into various languages, and was perhaps more widely diffused than any other work before the invention of printing. He became prior of the convent of Genoa, and when only thirty-seven was elected provincial of Lombardy. His appointment to this important post, while still so young, created some surprise throughout the order, but when the friars became witnesses of his benevolence and charity, and of the blessings which his wise and saintly administration drew down upon the houses committed to his charge, this feeling of surprise was exchanged for one of admiration and gratitude, and he continued to hold the office for the then unprecedented period of nineteen years. In the year 1288, Pope Honorius IV entrusted to him the delicate task of absolving the city of Genoa, in his name, from the censures and the interdict which it had incurred. Blessed James discharged this mission with such prudence and tact as to win all hearts, 
and not long afterwards the cathedral chapter unanimously elected him as archbishop. Genoa was at this time in a very distracted state, torn by the rival factions of the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, the scene of horrible murders and civil war. The saintly archbishop succeeded in re-establishing peace and order. He showed himself to be truly the father of his people, sparing no labor on their behalf, and stripping himself of everything in his boundless liberality to the poor. He also bestowed munificent benefactions on the hospitals, convents, and churches of his diocese. The crusaders had brought back with them, after the capture of Constantinople in 1203, a great quantity of holy relics. A portion of those which had fallen to the share of Venice passed into the possession of the Genoese, together with a considerable piece of the true cross. The pious archbishop succeeded in obtaining them, and deposited them in the Dominican church in Genoa, under two tables which he plated with silver. All through his life, Blessed James had made it his study to acquire interior peace, and his soul had become, according to the testimony of his contemporaries, a perfect mirror of the happiness of heaven. After eight years spent in governing his flock with such wisdom and success that most of the bishops of northern Italy took him for their counselor and model, and adopted his statutes for the reformation of their clergy, the saintly archbishop of Genoa gently fell asleep in the Lord in the July of the year 1298. His body was laid under the high altar of the church of St. Dominic in Genoa, where it received the veneration of the faithful until 1798, when it was translated to the church of the friar's preacher at San Santa Maria di Castello. A French and very solemn translation took place in the year 1885. Blessed James was beatified by Pius VII in 1816. 